Many humans today have Neanderthal DNA. What's lesser known is another early cousin to modern humans are the Denisovans. Some subgroups of humans have Denisovan DNA. What does that mean? The more we're coming to understand about the Denisovans who lived at least what we know, one remains were found in China, five were found in Siberia, mostly in high altitude climates such as the Altai Mountains. And with that, low oxygen and very cold climate is what they had to contend with, but they were somehow adapted to it. Now, we know that there are for many thousands of years on the Tibetan Plateau, there are long-standing traditions that have lived up there. We are now coming to understand that DNA from the Denisovans may have helped these early humans adapt to high altitude from getting hypoxia with low um, oxygen, as well as all the cold that's up there and the very few amounts of animals that there are around there and the ones that are around there are hard to hunt. They are the most rugged and beastly of them all. So with that being said, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into who were the Denisovans. Let's go a little bit beneath the surface and show why is it popping up in news nowadays. USA Today reports that scientists have discovered the oldest remains of a close relative to modern human. Dated at 200,000 years old, the bones are the oldest known remains of the Denisovans, a sister population to the Neanderthals, according to a study published Thursday in the monthly peer-reviewed journal Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. This is the first time we have the physical remains of Denisovans that we can securely date to 200,000 years ago, Samantha Brown, a co-author of the study, said in an email to USA Today. From here, we can investigate their technology and behaviors and hopefully start to understand this population a little better. ScienceAlert.com reports in an article titled, Our Extinct Cousins Reached the Roof of the World a Long Time Before Homo Sapiens. On the Tibetan plateau that sits 13,000 feet above sea level that covers most of Tibet, parts of China, India, and Pakistan, as well as other countries, is considered one of the last places Homo sapiens settled permanently. Studies suggest there have been periods of occupations by various ancestors taking place over the past 160,000 years, but gaps in the record are hard to interpret. According to recent DNA analysis, a single crossbreeding event between Denisovans and Homo sapiens in East Asia no sooner than 46,000 years ago might have infused our species with the genes they needed to make their home in such a low oxygen environment. Although we don't know if Denisovans were adapted to high altitude, the transmission of some of their genes to us could be the game changer thousands of years later for our species to get adapted to hypoxia, says anthropologist Nicholas Swintz from the University of California, Davis. Today, most modern Tibetans have DNA containing a special variation of the endothelial PAS1 gene, which helps humans withstand the lack of oxygen found at high altitudes by increasing oxygen transport in the blood. According to the authors of the current paper, recent genetic research has shown all East Asians, including Tibetans, hold the same pattern of Denisovan DNA. The scientist.com reports, until recently, scientists thought the modern humans with the highest proportion of Denisovan ancestry lived in Papua New Guinea and Australia. According to a new study published yesterday, August 12, 2021, in Current Biology, however, an indigenous group in the Philippines called the Aita Magbukan have 30 to 40 percent more Denisovan DNA than these other frontrunners for a total of nearly 5 percent of their genomes. And this was the earlier point I was making about genome sequencing. By sequencing more genomes in the future, we will have better resolution in addressing multiple questions, including how the inherited archaic tracts influenced our biology and how it contributed to our adaptation as a species, geneticist Maximilian Lorena says. Now, I've covered the Denisovans in the past, and I've showed a lot of their mark on the Americas primarily in South America, but in North American tribes, mainly the Cree and the Ojibwa, they have Denisovan DNA. And it's very interesting. You'll have to go back and check what I said there before. But 
There may be a connection between the mythology of the Thunderbirds, a class of species from the sky, according to the Native Americans. And among the Cree, or actually it would, it would be the Ojibwa, they had Grand Medicine Society. That was their shamanic caste. But they had another group that they would consult with called the Jessicid. And they would go to the Jessicid when their Grand Medicine Society could not figure out an illness or something they needed a shaman for. So they would go to the Jessicid who were remote and they liked to keep their own, um, basically they were a little antisocial, if you will, and they liked to keep to themselves. And every now and then they could perform miracles that the Grand Medicine Society could not. I won't go deeply in this, but I do want to go back to the book Denisovan Origins by Andrew Cullen because he says he believes there may be some kind of influence in the construction of Gobekli Tepe, the oldest known civilization remains on Earth right now. In the book Denisovan Origins, which was authored by Andrew Collins and Gregory Little, they find that the oldest civilized settlement ever found, Gobekli Tepe, was likely built in part by Swidirian groups from Russia and Ukraine as evidenced by microblade technology. Swidirian technologies found their way into Anatolia between 11,000 and 9,000 BCE. Collins writes, Current day archaeologists studying Anatolia's pre-pottery Neolithic world seem unwilling to accept the clear similarity between the Swidirian and Epigravetian toolkits from north of the Black Sea and those found at sites like Gobekli Tepe in southeastern Anatolia. Any proposal to this effect or suggestion that Gobekli Tepe was built by anyone other than hunter-gatherers is either to be belittled and laughed at on social media or dismissed outright as lies and pseudoscience. There is overwhelming evidence that the advanced stone tool technology adopted by the pre-pottery Neolithic world entered Anatolia from the north and almost certainly originated as far east as the Ural Mountains of Russia. And just so we're clear, Denisovan DNA is found in Central Asia, Southern Siberia, Vietnam, Japan, Korea, Solomon Islands, Australia, Mongolia, China, India, Tibet, Melanesia, Philippines, and South and North America. The Denisovans must have entered the Americas before the final submergence of the Bering Land Bridge. This is pretty interesting because basically what we're starting to understand now is that we've had more influences that have come from the past on who it is we are today. The big reason I want to point this out is in Ralph Metzner's book, Green Psychology. I'm just going to read to you the very end here. <clears throat> and this is a chapter where he is talking about psychedelics in, uh, psychedelics in traditional systems of transformation owing those traditional systems to three classes, shamanism, alchemy, and yoga. There are arguments that that could be a lot larger than that, but listen to what he says in here. It appears incontrovertible that plant and fungal hallucinogens played some role of unknown extent in the transformative traditions of shamanism, alchemy, and yoga. If we regard psychotherapy as the modern descendant of these traditional systems, then a similar, if limited, application of hallucinogens could be made in various aspects of psychotherapy. And this has, in fact, already occurred, as the various studies of psychedelics in alcoholism, terminal cancer, obsessional neurosis, depression, and other conditions testify. It seems likely that these kinds of applications of psychedelics as adjuncts to psychotherapy will continue, if not with LSD and other Schedule I drugs, then with other newer and perhaps safer psychedelics. The reason I'm getting into this is because there is something he's going to start getting into about touching base with our past that he doesn't clearly elucidate here, but I will mention over in the deeper dives specifically how we can start touching base, not just with the essence of who we are and where we've come from, but actually touching base potentially with the genes and the DNA of our very own ancestors. He says it may be such that a path will always be pursued by only a limited number of individuals. Much as the shamanic, alchemical, and yogic initiations and practices were pursued by only a few individuals in each society, 
I find it a hopeful sign that some people, however few, are willing to explore how to reconnect with those lost sources of knowledge. Because, like many others, I feel that our materialist technological society, with its fragmented worldview, has largely lost its way and can ill afford to ignore any potential aids to greater knowledge of the human mind. The ecologically balanced and integrative framework of understanding that the ancient traditions preserved surely has much to offer us. This last paragraph is good. Furthermore, it is clear that the visions and insights of the individual who pursues these paths are visions and insights for the present and the future, and not just of historical and anthropological interests. Let me say that one more time. It is clear that the visions and insights of the individuals who pursue these paths, shamanism, alchemy, and yoga, are visions and insights for the present and future, not just historical or anthropological. This has always been the pattern. The individual seeks a vision to understand his or her place or destiny as a member of the community. The knowledge derived from expanded states of consciousness has been, can be, and needs to be applied to the solution of the staggering problems that confront our species. This is why the discoveries of the mystical chemists and ethnobotanists have immense importance for the understanding of our past, the awareness of our presence, and the safeguarding of our future. I find that to be of utmost importance because of what I'm going to get into over at the Deeper Dives. And that is, there are ways that we can connect with our ancient yogic, alchemical, and shamanic roots in ways that we may not have actually needed blood or DNA in us specifically to touch base to those peripheral groups. The reason why I'm saying this is because there was this one meme that I saw from Robert Edward Grant. And he's basically saying history could be full of lies. And with that, the way we must connect with our past and who we are so we better understand the present and our potential future is by going within. It's great to get all this genetic and genome sequencing outside of us, but the bottom line is, is you can't say that you 100% trust everything you read on the internet. And if you do, there may be glaring holes in your understanding, not by any malicious design, but just by the fact that we're reading sporadic things out there. And if we don't meditate, if we don't have some practice of contemplation that helps us integrate all those little granular bits of news that we go through, then it may not turn into a cohesive and also living mythology. We need a living mythology. And what that means is it needs to be alive in us. We need to understand the philosophy that brought us here and the philosophy that will move us forward. We need to understand the biology that brought us here to understand the biology that moves us forward. We also should understand the technology that brought us here, which will help us understand technology moving forward. I'm not gonna get into the, the deep dark theories about how we've gotten here and why there's so much disinformation, misinformation, confusion, angst and anxiety in the world right now. I think it's obvious to most people, but most people are looking for whom to blame. I say we need to look for whom the solution is derived from, and that is us. That is all of us, but it has to be individual. So I'll end with this. The esoteric is not something that means bad. It simply means hidden, hidden to most. And you see, the greatest gifts of life are not just going to be handed to you. You're not going to have some culture say, listen, we figured out everything for you, so all you have to do is just sit back, sip on your pina colada or something non-alcoholic, and chill, because we did everything for you. Thanks, overlords. I'm glad my salvation came from you guys and not from within. It's getting a little bit, you know, um, sarcastic there, mainly to show you that the esoteric, the within, the, the place where you go within and nobody else can tell you whether you've done it right or not, only you truly know, 
that is the place where you will discover your greatest gifts. And I do believe we are superhuman, but I'm going to semantically challenge that. I think the more we understand who we are, the more we actually become what humans are meant to be on this planet. Not superhuman, not something beyond human, but actually fully human with all the compassion, all of the intelligence, and all of the willingness to harmonize with things that seem contradictory at first glance. But after a while, we may come to realize that the stress of coming together with community that maybe we would have rather not picked, the stress of it is what turns into diamonds. That's where the gift truly lies. So if we wish to move forward as a species from here in this next decade where technology is going to reign supreme, we might want to understand what bi biology has afforded us up until now. If you want to know deeper about what I'm getting at here with this book and how we can actually connect with our ancestors using movement, using nature, using mantra, and using very simple plant medicine, not just psychedelic, but plant medicine introductions into our diets can make the world of difference. So I want to appreciate every single one of you for continuing to come back to every single Waking Infinity News. Go over to benjosephstewart.com. Please become a member. Your support really, really helps me continue on with this work. And with that, every Thursday, I do a podcast live, 5 p.m. Eastern. I do acoustic nights on Fridays, and I'm going to be adding some more tiny microdoses throughout the week peppered in for all y'all. Please go to Spotify. You can listen to it there. Go to the Discord channel below. That's where the community comes together and talks about everything that I'm talking about here. And with that, I'll catch you guys next time on Waking Infinity News.